Hi, John, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. John, Sprott Inc. has just over $17 billion in assets and a large chunk of that, about $12 billion, is allocated toward the physical trust business, mostly in gold, silver, and platinum. But you also recently started a new product, the Uranium Trust. And why don't we just start there and give us a brief overview and the history behind it and what was the catalyst for starting it? Sure, yeah. So as you mentioned, um, Sprott's very well known for managing a suite of precious metals uh, commodity funds. And these are very unique in that they only hold physical metals fully allocated and segregated and stored at the Royal Canadian Mint. And you know, we thought, given the success we have with this suite of funds, what other commodities could we put into this, this type of uh, vehicle? And one of the commodities we identified that we thought was a good candidate was physical uranium. And a few years ago, we started to do work on, on whether we could launch a new uranium trust. And at that time, uranium, unfortunately, was in a pretty, pretty uh, bare, you know, very deep, long, bare market and decided that trying to get a new trust off the ground from scratch was going to be a very difficult undertaking because of timing. Um, so as an alternative, we started to pursue Uranium Participation Corp, which has been around uh, since 2005. So we made the acquisition for Uranium Participation Corp. It, had, it gave us a great starting point. It had 18 million pounds of physical uranium in it, and obviously a very long history. And given our experience and expertise in the physical commodity side, you know, we had a number of different ideas on how we could make the vehicle uh, more shareholder friendly, more transparent, more liquid. And, uh, and more efficient at raising capital. And that's exactly what we, uh, we did with the reorganization of UPC into the new Sprott Uranium Trust, which started uh, trading on July 19th of 2021. And what is the AUM? When you took it over, what was the AUM of UPC and what is it now? Sure, so when we took over the, uh, the company and reorganized it, there was approximately 630 million US dollars of assets. There was about 18 million pounds of U308. And then you fast forward to, you know, end of September and uh, the AUM of the fund is around 1.4 billion. And you might say, well, how did that happen in such a short period of time? And it was really twofold. Uh, one, the price of uranium has gone from kind of the low 30s up until today, I would say it's trading around 43, $44 a pound. Um, but as early as last week, it, you know, it hit $50 a pound. So we've had this big lift in the price of uranium. And second of all, uh, we've implemented something called an at the market uh, capital raising mechanism, which allows us to issue new shares in the trust when it's accretive uh, to do so. And through that mechanism, we've raised a little over 400 million US dollars, uh, which we think is just fantastic in terms of the investor interest we've seen. Um, post, post the reorganization, there was a lot of pent up interest in the trust and uh, investors are expressing their interest by by buying new units in the trust. So you just said that you activate the ATM when it's accretive to do so. Does that mean when it's trading above NAV? Exactly. So we have a fundamental task each day where uh, we have to we have to ensure that any new units that are issued are at a higher price than than the prior day net asset value. And speaking of the net asset value, this is really a key enhancement we we implemented with the trust, and that is every night we publish a net asset value. And for context, the predecessor vehicle UPC would do a monthly net asset value. And we think this change is really important because one, it allows the ATM to operate, but more importantly, it gives transparency to all investors around exactly what is the value of the underlying assets within the trust. And they can gauge how the fund is trading each day in the market relative to the implicit value or, or implied value of the trust. So um, this is really important for price discovery in terms of investors, understanding exactly how the, how the trust units are trading. Are they cheap or are they, are they expensive relative to that implied value? And I do, I do think it gives the marketplace a, a heightened level of confidence around exactly what they own and, and, and how, to, how, to, you know, trade the, how to trade the fund more effectively. So in addition to the trust trading above NAV, what about the price of uranium? Does that also come into effect? And also, do you have to have supply somewhere like in the horizon before you initiate this ATM? 
Sure, that's a great question. I mean, uranium is a very different commodity market than when than we're used to. Um, you know, we're used to being able to track, uh, uh, transact in very large volumes in very short periods of time in the precious metals markets. And uranium just does not move that quickly. It's uh, it's obviously a, a, a byproduct of uh, buying in the utility by the utilities, which you know are not in any rush to do so. Uh, so everything moves a little slower. You're de you're dealing with a lot more time zones. Um, but it is important, getting back to your question about having some line of sight on the material and where someone is, is willing to let go of that material to the trust. So we're constantly mindful of where's the trust trading relative to its NAV and where could we put, uh, where, do we, where do we think we'd have to spend uh, per pound to buy more, more, more uh, uranium to back the units that we would be issuing. So it is, a, it is an important consideration. And remind me again, did you say you have acquired 10 million pounds? Yeah, so the, when we acquired the trust originally, there was about 18 million pounds of U308. And um, since August 17th, we've added uh, about 10.3 million pounds. So the fund is over 28 million pounds of U308. So just to give you some perspective, uh, from 2005 to the middle of 2021, it took UPC that period of time to accumulate 18 million pounds, and we've done about 10 million pounds in, a, in about five weeks. So it just illustrates the power and the efficiency of the ATM uh, uh, mechanism. John, BHP has a very large copper mine in Australia called Olympic Dam, and uranium is a byproduct. And I've read that they tend to sell that uranium into the spot market. So just a hypothetical, if they were to come in and sell a large uh, chunk of uranium and they, it drove the price down in the spot market, and let's just say drastically, how would you handle redemptions? Assuming, of course, you, you did get some redemptions because of that price move. Sure, well, right now the trust does not have a redemption feature built, in, built in, into it. Uh, and obviously the complexities of trying to deliver physical uranium are, 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 are very different than delivering bars of gold or silver with our other trusts. So right now, there is no physical redemption uh, mechanism or cash redemption mechanism. And, and that's important to understand because I think one of the things that's overhanging the uranium market is this fear that there will be this big secondary supply of material like there was after Fukushima that will somehow undermine the market or, or basically uh, push the price down. And as I said earlier, the, the mandate of the fund is to operate in perpetuity, and it's a passive holding company. That means we basically raise capital, buy material, and stockpile it. Um, it's not designed to trade material. It's not designed to lease material or loan material to anybody. It's, a, it's really a passive vehicle that's designed to operate in perpetuity. And now I'm curious, I want to find out a little bit more about the market itself. Who are the actual sellers of uranium? Who is it you phone on a regular basis to find the supply? Sure. Well, we have a technical advisor called WMC Energy, and there's two individuals there that are both based out of the U.S. Um, they're both ex-chemical employees, and they've been a wonderful resource for the trust. And they basically assist us with all things physical uranium. So everything from procuring uranium to the contracts around those purchases to the end storage. And um, they've cast a very wide net in the marketplace. I mean, given the size of the trust and, uh, and the buying demand that, that we may be encountering from week to week, we wanna make sure we have the best offers in front of us. So I think we've done uh, trades with 15 different counterparties so far, which I think is a great sign that a lot of people are interested in doing business with the trust. Um, and so we're looking for the best offers, whether it's coming from a trader, a producer, a utility, uh, an investment fund. Um, we've even bought a little bit of material from a junior uh, uranium miner. So we're basically scouring the world and, and trying to find the best pounds available with the shortest delivery windows possible. And so you raise a good point there about the, the delivery. When I buy a mm -hmm. stock in the market, it's settlement is T plus two. What's the settlement day for uranium? Yeah, that, that took a little while to get my head wrapped around uh, the, the nuances of the uranium market. So typically in, uh, in when you're buying physical, um, near-term deliveries is, is generally around 30 days. So within 30 days, there's a process to, for the seller to notify 
the storage facility that they're going, they've sold the material and they need to change ownership title from, from them to us. Uh, that takes about 10 days, but the whole process can take about 30 days just to move the ownership title within, within uh, an existing warehouse arrangement. If you're talking about buying out in term, that could be two, three, four months. Generally, those pounds of material are, are usually in transit to a facility. So sometimes you have to wait two or three or four months to actually uh, take title of that material and um, settle up with cash. So right now, this product only trades in Toronto, but you are seeking a U.S. listing. What's the timeline associated with that? Yeah, the Toronto uh, listing has worked out very well. It's attracted a, a lot of uh, different investors from uh, around the world. One of the things we did with the reorganization of the trust is, is to also offer in U.S. dollars along with Canadian dollars. So that appeals to a, a broader set of investors. The end goal is obviously to dual list the trust like all of our other funds on the New York uh, Stock Exchange. And we're starting that work right now to, to prep our, our primary listing um, application. And one of the things I'm often asked is, well, how long is that gonna take? And my answer is simply, I don't know. Because until you get into the actual uh, process with the SEC and start to receive comment letters, you really don't know how they're gonna react, what are the questions they're gonna focus on, um, it will be considered a novel listing, uh, and that's simply for the fact that no one has ever taken a uranium, physical uranium fund through the SEC process from start to finish. So we're going to be the test case, and whenever you're the test case, uh, there's always a bit of a wild card element to the process. And John, you mentioned earlier that the AUM is currently around $1.4 Do you expect that to grow significantly when you do get that U.S. listing? I think it'll I think it'll clearly help. I think it will open the fund to a, a greater audience. Uh, but I would say that the TSX listing and what it's done and the ATM in Canada has been very, very effective in terms of attracting new investors. So we're really happy with the TSX. I know we always think of it as the, you know, in the shadow of New York, but I think it's doing a really great job. And what about the ATM? Will that change in any way when you get the US listing? Um, we run ATMs on our, our dual listed funds on both sides of the border. And um, thankfully, about a year ago, the, um, the regulator here uh, relaxed the rules around ATMs to make them much more competitive with their U.S. counterparts. So we don't see any structural differences between running an ATM on the TSX and, one, and running, uh, running one on, on the New York exchange. John, spot uranium started the year at $30, has gotten high as 50 bucks, so now it's somewhere around 45, give or take. Do you think the utilities are paying attention to what's happening in the spot, or do they only care about the term market? Um, I think the utilities are definitely watching very closely, and the reason I'm saying that is because they're calling us, some of them. Um, and I would say it's not, they're not calling because they're alarmed, they're calling to basically get facts. They want to better understand how the trust works. How does the ATM work? How does the capital raising work? Um, because I think they're all trying to understand how the landscape is moving. And you know, one of the things about uranium, as I said, it was in a horrible multi-year bear market where the price was either falling or going sideways for many years. And the reality was there was no urgency for a lot of utilities to to reload contracts. The price was kind of going sideways, or you know, they were already locked in a previous supply agreement. So. Um, I think they're paying attention. The spot market is obviously not the term market where they where they play. But as we know, when you look at the at the yield curve, um, short term short term curve does affect the long term end of the curve as well. So they are they are watching. They are trying to figure out how that may impact and 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 how they may have to adjust some of their 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 strategies going forward. So I was speaking with somebody earlier today and they told me that they, they're hearing there's four different RFPs out there from utilities. Are you hearing the same sort of thing? Um, I've heard there's a couple of bellwether ones out there right now, one in the US and one in Asia. That is going to be the first test and the first signal around uh, where do those contracts get uh, completed what kind of prices, and everyone is, is waiting to see those. I think it'll be an important uh, event, but I don't think it's people should read too much into it because this contracting cycle um, moves slowly and it has a lot of runway to go. We think the next couple of years 
is really what is going to drive the longer term price as, as utilities uh, enter a new contracting cycle. So one of the things that can kill a bull market is, is supply. And we saw that back in 2007 when uranium got up to 137 bucks. We saw a lot of supply come into the market. And then of course it just killed demand. At what price do you think we're gonna start seeing more supply? At what price do you think these producers who are currently offline start producing mm -hmm. again? Yeah, I don't I don't know what that price is, but I think um, if you listen to Cameco and, and Kazaprom, um, you know, they've been incredibly disciplined the last few years. Um, and, you know, they, you know, they were forced to, obviously, the market imposed uh, a very difficult situation on them where they had to had to close down and cut back production. And I think, you know, they're watching, they're watching what's happening, obviously, in the spot market, that, that these contracts in the term market are going to give them some signals. But um, I think they need to see this uranium price really kind of firm and stay firm for a period of time before they're really going to change tack and and uh, and, and start to in, increase production out in time. Uh, you know, I just don't think they're going to have a knee-jerk reaction. The cost and time to bring these mines back uh, in into production is not short. Um, so if you're going to make a decision, you you better be very confident about it. Other you're, otherwise, you're going to have another false start. Well, that's a great overview of the uranium market, John. I want to ask you one more question before mm -hmm. I let you go. Uranium's up 40 plus percent on the year. Gold's down 10 percent. Silver's down 20 percent. Is gold ever going to catch a bit again? Uh, yes, we de we definitely think gold is going to catch a bit again. I think uh, we're very frustrated by the price of gold and silver. Um, I think right now gold is in a kind of a dormant state. It's not dead, but it's dormant. Uh, and I think a function, the function of that is really everybody is in kind of a risk on mode right now. You know, in 2020, gold was a star. Uh, it really did its job in terms of providing portfolio insurance and, and helped to mitigate against a lot of risks um, in the market when COVID uh, exploded. And, um, you know, fast forward to the last, you know, if you go back the last 12 months, um, people's attitudes about uh, the recovery and, uh, the valuation of financial assets has changed dramatically. And so in a, in this very cheap money accommodative uh, monetary and fiscal policy environment, uh, investors are being incented, incented to take risk. And, and gold is not a risk asset. It's a risk off asset, as we know. Silver, I think, is more, is more uh, perplexing to us in terms of the fact that it is a hybrid metal. It is a, a monetary and a, an industrial metal. And, and we're we're totally blown away that it is not uh, much stronger than it, than it is right now. Well, thank you for those insights on both uranium and also gold, John. And to all of our viewers, if any of you have any further questions for John or the Sprott team, please send us an email to info at wallstreetcapital.com and we'll get you an answer. Once again, John, thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.